Hi, and welcome to the Dynamic Duel Podcast, a weekly show where we review superhero films and debate the superiority between Marvel and DC by comparing their characters in stat-based battle simulations. I'm Marvelous Joe. And I'm his twin brother, Johnny DC. And in this episode that we've been building toward for a few months now, we're going to find out who would win in a fight between the rogues and the Brotherhood of Mutants. It's the Flash villains versus the X-Men villains. We've done several team duels now. I believe this is the eighth team duel that we've done. Uh, our last one was Young Justice versus Young Avengers. But I believe this is only the second villain team duel that we've done. The previous being Sinister Six versus Arkham Asylum, which was Spider-Man villains versus Batman villains. Yeah, we did do another duel, which was Suicide Squad versus Defenders. So this is actually like my third go round with villains. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But uh, yeah, it's always fun to see how far you could take these matches with these lower moral characters. Yeah, it's been really interesting learning more about the rogues and the Brotherhood over these past few months. And I'm really excited to speculate on the battle and also find out who'll win. The way we do that, of course, if you've never listened to one of our episodes before, is by running 1000 simulations using the character's statistics. It's a bit more involved for team duels, but we'll get into that later. Before that, we're going to break down the comic book movie news that came out this past week, including the first official trailer for the Blue Beetle movie that we got. And we got another trailer, this time for Marvel, uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse official trailer number two. And we got news that James Mangold is going to write and direct Swamp Thing, confirmed by Mangold himself, as well as James Gunn. Yeah, big episode, exciting episode. Team duel, we got trailers, it's going to be a lot of fun. As always, we list our segment times in our episode description, so feel free to check out the show notes if you want to skip ahead to a particular topic. Those of you who have listened to our recent episodes will know that our dual simulator has become so advanced that it's gained sentience, and it's named itself the Artificial Life Form for Running Extensive Duels, just a rather very intelligent simulator 9000, or Alfred Jarvis 9000. Yeah, he has a quick message for our listeners, so let's hear it. Why, hello there. Do you love listening and chatting about Marvel and DC? Then become a part of the Dynamic Duel community on Patreon, where you can choose from three tiers. The Dynamic 2.0 tier lets you listen to this podcast without ads and gives you access to its Discord chat group, where you can chat with Johnny DC and Marvelous Joe. The Fantastic Four tier gives you that and more with two bonus episodes each month, including bloopers and top 10 shows where Johnny and Joe count down your favorite Marvel and DC subjects. And finally, the X-Force tier makes you an executive producer of Dynamic Duel, where every month you help the host choose what to review and who to fight against each other. Check it out at patreon.com slash dynamic duel. Pip pip cheerio. Thanks AJ9000 and thanks to everyone who supports our podcast. Yeah, big time breaking news, by the way. Uh, Jonathan and I have just launched a new Patreon tier, one that allows aspiring podcasters to create their own battle-focused show using our simulator as part of the new Dynamite podcast network. It's like dynamic, but M-I-C capitalized because it spells out the word Mike. Not only will we help you develop your show, but we'll provide graphic support and consultation and we'll get you simulation results to announce on your show. We already have one show in the works with one of our executive producers, Ken Johnson, that we'll be announcing later. But basically, it's going to be live action movie heroes pit up against each other. Yeah, think James Bond versus Jason Bourne, Indiana Jones versus Han Solo, things like that. I don't know if those are the exact matchups that Ken wants to do, but that's the premise. If anyone is interested in pitching us a show and joining our new Patreon tier and network, let us know via email at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com or by reaching out to us on social media. Right now, we're only accepting up to five podcasts as a part of this network, so space is limited. Exciting stuff is in the works, but with that out of the way, quick to the no prize. A no prize is an award Marvel used to give out to fans. Our version, the Dynamic Duel No Prize, is a digital award that we post on Instagram and in our email newsletter for the person that we feel gave the best answer to our question of the week. Last week's question, we asked you guys, what has been your favorite Marvel or DC trailer of all time and why? And we got literally one answer this past what? week. What the <laughs> heck? That's, that's the fewest number of answers we've ever gotten. I don't know if it was too vague of a question or if people just had a lot of shit to do coming up to Easter weekend. Uh, but yeah, one answer. So no honorable mentions and one no prize winner. This week's no prize goes to Jose Marcial, 
who said, For me, this is a very easy answer. It's the Man of Steel teaser that was attached to Dark Knight Rises. Uh, just seeing Superman break the sound barrier at the end of that sent goosebumps down my spine and still does to this day. I still remember seeing this teaser for Man of Steel in theaters. I think it did a great job of setting the tone for this film and really for the Snyderverse as a whole. Uh, just with the music and the voiceover and like the Terrence Malick-esque shots. It was just gorgeous. It was beautiful, the whole thing. The trailer actually had two voiceovers, one by Russell Crowe's Jor-El and the other by Kevin Costner's Jonathan Kent. And I think different theaters got different versions of it. And I thought both voiceovers really worked with the visuals that we saw. We didn't actually get a good look at Superman. At the very end of the trailer, you do see him like rocketing up into the sky. But at the very end, we did get a good shot of the new logo, which I think is still the best Superman logo that has ever existed. Really, I liked Superman Returns S Shield logo. That one was good. This one is still better, though, in my opinion. I remember just thinking it, it looked very alien, like more alien than any other Superman emblem we'd seen up to that point. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's like very organic. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was an OK trailer. You know, I was like, whoop de doo Fucking Superman. <laughs> I feel Who like cares? if you weren't a fan of that tone and that take on the character, you probably didn't care for this teaser trailer. But I was very intrigued. Honestly, it was a good teaser. I do remember thinking, though, that the final shot of Superman breaking the sound barrier was a ripoff of the original Iron Man teaser that was pretty much the same shot, except instead of flying upward, Iron Man was flying sideways and he broke the sound barrier in that trailer. So basically, they were ripping off Marvel. Bitch, please. Like, Superman was breaking the sound barrier way before <laughs> Iron Man. <laughs> Not on screen, he wasn't. Whatever. Not in that cool visual style. But uh, congrats to Jose Marcial. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer this week's no prize question. Unlike the rest of you bums. Yeah, get your shit together. <laughs> if you, the listener, want to shot at winning your own no prize, stay tuned to later on this episode when we'll be asking another question of the week. But now that that's done, on to the news. <laughs> All right, so last week we got our very first Blue Beetle trailer. It's one that I've been looking forward to for a long time, you know, ever since they announced the film was in the works and we got to see like the really cool Blue Beetle concept art in the DC fandom. Blue Beetle is one of the coolest looking characters visually. So that was what I was most looking forward to in this trailer. And it did not disappoint. No, the, the Blue Beetle armor looks every bit as cool as it should look. It's like Iron Man armor with an alien twist and, you know, a different color scheme, but every bit is cool. Some might say derivative, but no. I hope that general audiences don't see it that way. I mean, I guess you can say that because the mouth doesn't move or open like it does in the comics, but uh, I think it looks different enough. And I got to say, for a movie that was originally supposed to be released on HBO Max exclusively... The special effects in this trailer, with maybe the exception of the Kajida Scarab, look fantastic. Very polished. Well, even the Scarab looks pretty cool, I think. It looks very, you know, high tech in a very alien energy sort of way. I'm, I'm definitely glad this movie's going to theaters now. Yeah, the Scarab looks like a badass toy that I can't wait to buy. <laughs> uh, you know they'll be releasing it for oh, sure. Oh yeah, for sure. Now, the trailer starts off with Jaime Reyes looking out over the ocean from this house with a pool behind him, and he looks like a badass. But then we quickly learn that he's there to clean the house with his family. Yeah, great setup. Pretty funny, honestly. And I think the first thing I was surprised by was how old Solo Maridueña was, because I would never seen Cobra Kai, so I assumed that he was a kid. He looks to be like almost 20 here, which is about the right age. But I just thought he'd be younger for some reason. I think he could play between like 17 and 20, maybe. He's around that age, I think. Uh, the guy is 21 years old right now. Soon to be 22. Okay, I was pretty close. Yeah, but still older than I thought. Well, the Jaime Reyes version of the Blue Beetle character is supposed to be a teen hero, and I think he passes for a teen. Oh yeah, for sure. Early in the trailer, we see him go to uh, Cord Industries, it looks like, to try and pitch... Uh, his family's cleaning service to them. But in the process, he meets an acquaintance who gives him a big belly burger carton, which I thought was a nice shout out to the comics, which looks like it contains the scarab. The scene where Jaime is with his family in the kitchen 
and like the scarab just jumps on his face and everybody starts screaming was one of my favorite moments of the trailer. I was laughing out loud. I think the part that surprised me the most from that scene in this preview was Solo Maridonia's acting ability. Because I, again, I've never seen him in anything and I thought he did pretty well when he's telling his sister, like, I don't think it's a burger. It's those small idiosyncrasies within the performance, like the gulp that he makes because, you know, he's kind of nervous. I thought it played off really well. Well, yeah, I mean, I think you could almost consider him the lead of Cobra Kai. He does a fantastic job. He's a good actor for sure. I'm not surprised he was chosen to lead a movie. The sort of body horror scene that follows all of the screaming where the scarab is just taking over his body, I thought was also very interesting and kind of horrifying. It was at this point that I felt like the film is kind of like a mishmash between Miss Marvel and maybe Venom in that regard. Oh, interesting observation. That sounds pretty good, though. Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, I liked Miss Marvel. I liked the family angle to that. And, you know, in terms of like power and semi horror. Yeah, Venom is not the worst inspiration. I have to say, though, that the next few shots I didn't love. I think the marketing team made a mistake when you have essentially a recreation of the scene in Shazam. We have Zachary Levi's character falling from the sky and stopping at the last minute, hovering a few inches off the ground. The exact same thing is happening here, like almost shot for shot. And while that's happening, you have music that's saying repeatedly, this ain't what you want. It's almost like the marketing team was purposefully trying to put a bad taste in people's mouth. Oh, I didn't mind the song choice at all. What are you talking about? This ain't what you want, really? I feel like those aren't the best lyrics for marketing. Hey, if some alien symbiote was like taking over my body, I also would not want that. Maybe I would, actually. If I could yeah, if it gave you cool powers, why not? <laughs> okay. Yeah, but it sounds like they're saying this movie isn't what you want or something. I don't no. know. I was like, really? No. Okay. Am I You're reading, reading too much, way into, too much it? into it? Yeah. Okay. Fuck off. I will. Bye. <laughs> what? <laughs> but no, once he's like in his suit and like we get to see him like doing different things with it, that is the joy of reading Blue Beetle, just seeing all the different things that he could do with the suit. And he does some amazing things in this trailer. He cuts a bus in half? Yeah, with like an energy shield. That was crazy. And it was a really good showcase of the expression that the suit can deliver, even though it's like a full face mask. The uh, the last shot of the trailer where he creates these like two arm swords that fuse into one large sword that looks like the Buster Sword from Final Fantasy. Yeah, the shot kind of came across like it's part of a, a montage where he's basically learning how to use his powers. I don't believe the audio that's going over that shot in this trailer is the audio that's going to be in the movie where the computer's like, Anything you imagine I can create. Good choice. Sit on my face. <laughs> what? I, <don't. laughs> I loved that scene. I thought it was really cool. Didn't love the voice for Kajida, though. It's way too close to Siri. It does sound like Siri. Yeah. Why? I don't know if the scarab was like technologically modified by Victoria Cord or something like that. I, I don't know. I didn't like it. Do you think that's Solo Mariduena in the suit doing those cool uh, karate kicks in this trailer? I mean, he definitely has martial arts skills as evident in Cobra Kai. So, yeah, I think it actually was him. And it does look like, you know, as we've seen from behind the scenes shots, that he's wearing a practical suit in some instances. So it's cool to see that he can move so well in the costume. In the very final shot in the trailer, it looks like they're on Ted Kord's Blue Beetle hovercraft, the bug, you know? Right. And in the background, you could see... Ted Kord's and Dan Garrett's costumes, which I thought was a pretty damn cool shout out to the history of the character. Very, very cool Easter egg. I did not expect to see the bug in this movie. I'm really hoping that Ted Kord makes an appearance, and I'm really hoping it's played by Jason Sudeikis. Is he in this movie? No, but I mean, a guy could dream, can't he? Because obviously they need some version of Ted Kord at some point in this franchise, because clearly his presence is in the movie. But he hasn't been cast or anything that we know of, right? No, he hasn't. But I'm hoping it's a surprise casting. Maybe like an after credit scene or something. Could be cool. I just really don't see Victoria Cord getting into that Blue Beetle costume, you know? That is Susan Sarandon's character? Yes. Okay. I did not appreciate the line at the very end by George Lopez's character when he said that <laughs> Batman was a fascist. What is with all of this Batman hate? What's up with DC always dissing themselves in these trailers? Right. Like, it happens pretty frequently. Like, Aquaman fucks fish, Batman is a fascist. What? No, never. 
I mean, technically, all superheroes are fascists because they impose their will through force. Right. Which is like the definition of fascism. So I kind of see where he's coming from. But also, it's fucking superheroes. It's just it's just part of the package. Despite that last line, the trailer overall got me super excited for this movie. And I can't wait to see it. August 18th. You know what comes out sooner and is going to be better? That's right. The Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse <laughs> movie. We got the official trailer number two this past week. And honestly... It was the trailer I think I've been waiting for this whole time for this movie. Yeah, it was way better than the last one at the very least. Yeah, the last trailer was basically like five minutes of some sentimental talk between Miles Morales and his mom where she's like, I can't wait to see what kind of man you're going to be because you're still my baby and I love you. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, and it had footage from the first movie. Yeah, right. But this one does a complete 180 and gives us a lot of great stuff from this upcoming movie. Like we get to see the spot for the first time voiced by Jason Schwartzman. I'm so glad that we did a duel with that character these past few weeks going up against Mirror Master because it's pretty funny to see him here being introduced to Miles Morales. And, you know, Miles pretty much having the same exact reaction to his name that Peter Parker did in the comics where he laughs at him, basically. (laughs) But the the spots on the character of the spot are much more organic looking here. They're not like perfect circular portals. They're more like Dalmatian spots, honestly. And that's what Miles calls him. Yeah, that was funny. That was a good line. Eventually in the trailer, Miles meets up with Gwen, who takes him to this Spider-Man headquarters where all the best Spider-Man from across the multiverse meet up. Kind of like a council of Spider-Man, as it were. You know, like the Council of Kangs or the... Council of Ricks or something like that. Yeah. Council of Reeds. Yeah, it's an interdimensional like headquarters known as the Lobby, apparently. It was started and is head up by Miguel O'Hara, who is Spider-Man 2099, voiced by Oscar Isaac. And I thought it was interesting how when Miles is like, how do I join this thing? Miguel was like, you can never join. And don't get me started about Doctor Strange and that nerd from Earth 1999-99. You know, as a fanboy, it poses a lot of questions Because we know that in the Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Bandis movie, the MCU was designated Earth 616. But here he's calling it a different numerical designation for the MCU, one that's been largely established by the fans for years now, and that's 1999-99. The comics universe is Earth 616, and that was kind of like an Easter egg in the Multiverse of Bandis movie. Well, I feel like the world that Doctor Strange went to in Multiverse of Madness, like they had their own number designations. I don't think it was like the official one. Right. Yeah. I'm I'm sure every single universe that is cataloging the multiverse has its own numerical system. So not a big deal in my mind, but I thought the shout out was really cool. And, you know, the rumor is that Tom Holland will be making a cameo in this Spider-Verse movie. Yeah. And it looks like baby Mayday Parker will also be making an appearance. How freaking awesome is that? That is so cool to see Peter Parker return to the story and now with a baby with Mary Jane. True to comics, her name is Mayday Parker and she has her dad's abilities and will one day grow up to be Spider-Girl. I love everything about that. I hope we get to, you know, see Mayday Parker grow up into the hero that we know she'll be. Yeah, I mean, there's one more movie after this. Maybe in that film, that'll be cool. Maybe. After all that setup, it looks like the crux of the story is... Miles is trying to save someone that is important to him, maybe a member of his family. Kind of looks like it's being set up to be his father. But somehow the act of saving this person will affect the larger multiverse. And so Miles has this kind of crisis of conscience that kind of feels like a large scale man on the train tracks thought experiment. Save one person or save many people. Yeah, it's fascinating. I didn't know that's where this story was going to go, but I love it. Actually, everything after when Miguel is explaining that, like, no, Spider-Man does not always save the day. I was, like, very, very invested in this trailer. Yeah, because Miles seems convinced that he can save everybody. But the lesson that the rest of the Spider-Men are trying to teach him is that, you know, sometimes sacrifice is just part of being Spider-Man. We know that Miles himself lost his uncle. A lot of the other Spider-Men lost Uncle Ben. Spider-Gwen lost Peter Parker. Sacrifices like that. It'll be interesting to see how the uh, the story plays out to where it's basically Miles and probably Gwen against the whole Spider-Verse Spider-Man. And there's a lot of them. There are a ton. That final shot where 
Spider-Man is in therapy and everybody busts through the wall is pretty impressive. You know, the animation on these films is freaking incredible. And I can't wait to see how all of that unfolds when the movie comes out in just a few months on June 2nd. It'll probably be the last film I get to see in theaters for a while before the birth of my own baby girl. So it'll be an exciting time. I guess now you're going to have to name her Mayday, right? I might, yeah, reconsider her name. Maybe I should call her Mayday and she'll grow into a big Marvel fan, just like her dad. At least her middle name. (laughs) I'm going to do to her what you did to your daughters and just like totally indoctrinate her on Team Marvel and not even let her watch the DC stuff and (laughs) convince her that like DC is the equivalent of like evil, basically. (laughs) I remember when your daughter Grace picked up a a Disney comic and I told her, oh, that's like a Marvel comic because Disney owns Marvel. And she cried. At that point, I knew you were a bad father (laughs) (laughs) or a very good father. (laughs) But uh, it was a good trailer. Not as good as the Blue Beetle trailer, I think. But uh, we're going to let you guys decide because that's our question of the week. Which trailer was better? The Blue Beetle official trailer or the Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse trailer number two. Record your answer at dynamicduel.com by clicking on the red microphone button in the bottom right-hand corner, which will prompt you to leave us a voicemail. Your message could be up to 30 seconds long, and don't forget to leave your name in case we include you on the podcast. We'll pick our favorite answer and award that person a Dynamic Duel No Prize that we'll post to Instagram and our email newsletter. Be sure to answer before April 15th. In our last bit of news, James Mangold accidentally let slip during an interview with Collider that he is not only directing Swamp Thing, which had been rumored, but he is also, in fact, writing it as well. This is awesome news. I'm a big fan of James Mangold, especially after he made Logan. That is hands down one of the best superhero movies that has ever been made. And it sounds like, according to James Gunn, who confirmed the news on Twitter, that James Mangold is a huge fan of the Swamp Thing character. Now, I remember you saying that the Swamp Thing television series that was on DC Universe would be hard to top. But with this news, I would be surprised if this Swamp Thing movie wasn't just ridiculously awesome. Because Logan was ridiculously awesome, and James Mangold also wrote that film as well as directed. Yeah, I mean, I still think it'll be hard to top, but if anyone is going to do it, it's going to be James Mangold. I'm super excited for him to work on Swamp Thing, and I really hope he gets to work on this before his Star Wars project, because he essentially told Collider, like, I'm not sure which one is going to come first. I hope it's Swamp Thing. That said, his Star Wars project does sound pretty dope as well. It's about the start of the Jedi Order. Oh, that's pretty cool. Honestly, I think I'd rather see that. No, shut up. But we'll see what happens. Great news for DC fans, for sure. But I think that does it for all the news for this episode. So let's go ahead and get into the main event, the event that everyone's been waiting for for a few months now, where we find out who would win in a fight between the rogues and the Brotherhood of Mutants. The Rogues versus the Brotherhood of Mutants. Long time coming. Jonathan, why are we pitting these two supervillain teams against each other? This was a team matchup chosen by our executive producers. I think it's a great one. I think both teams of villains are extremely powerful because they have to go up against extremely powerful heroes. Yeah, I don't remember thinking there being any other rationale to this fight other than it would be really cool to see these guys go head to head. You know, there's not too many comparisons thematically between these two teams or powers wise, with the exception of Captain Cold and Pyro. But I think they're both highly respected villain groups within their respective universes with some pretty interesting abilities across the board. And it's hard to say which team is more powerful and therefore which team will win. Well, the rogues. It's going to be the rogues. Is it now? Why do you think that? Because they're so much more versatile. Why do you think the Flash has such a hard time defeating them? Because the Flash isn't very good. Okay. It's like saying Quicksilver can take on the entire Brotherhood, you know, just with his super speed. I don't think that's the case when it comes to Marvel's mutant villain team. It takes more than just one hero to defeat these guys. You have an entire team of X-Men going up against the Brotherhood. And uh, I think that will be the rogue's downfall. And I think you're about to learn a very hard lesson that you don't underestimate the rogues. And I think you're going to feel very humbled 
at the end of this episode. Well, I think laugh. that you're <laughs> dumb. <laughs> All right, well, let's get into it, and we'll go ahead and turn to our sentient dual simulator, Alfred Jarvis 9000. Explain to our listeners how he goes about determining a winner in these team dual matchups. Yes, of course, sir. The way I determine a winner between the two teams is by running 1,000 Monte Carlo simulations between every character on each team using their statistics. A Monte Carlo simulation is a probabilistic model used to determine outcomes through random sampling. In this case, I randomize the statistics along a normal distribution as a way to simulate the many variables that can occur during battle. The stat parameters are based on the official Marvel power grid, from which the DC character's statistics are extrapolated. Additional stat categories are included such as range, damage potential, versatility and perception, in order to create a more detailed and accurate simulation. The results of the 49,000 simulations provide a percentage of wins for each character on both teams. The team with the higher average win rate is declared the victor as they have a higher probability to win any given battle. In an equitable pairing, neither team should win 100% of the matches. The comic book stories have shown that there's even a way for Batman to defeat Superman, so the confidence rate of my method falls in line with the precedents that have been established in the source material. My mathematical simulations are without subjectivity or bias. Feats are not the sole consideration, nor are fan votes tabulated for determination of the winner. Thanks, AJ9000. Before we run the simulations, though, we like to break down each team's histories and rosters before improvising a scenario on how we imagine one of the many simulated matches between these teams would play out beat for beat. Yeah, it's my turn to go first with the Marvel backstory, so let me go ahead and tell you all about the history of the Brotherhood of Mutants. While most supervillain teams consist of criminal masterminds joining together to form a greater threat... The Brotherhood of Mutants originated with more ideological and even political goals in mind, namely to protect mutants against the prejudices of mankind, to deliver justice to their injustices, and occasionally to strive for world domination in order to achieve these ends. The original group was founded years ago by Magneto, the mutant master of magnetism who, growing up a survivor of the Holocaust during World War II, experienced firsthand many of the atrocities humanity was capable of inflicting upon those deemed lesser than. Convinced that his former friend Professor Xavier was wrong in his belief that humans and mutants could coexist in peace, Magneto formed the Brotherhood of Mutants to counter the Professor's new team of mutant recruits called the X-Men, whose conflicting goal was to protect humanity. You can learn more about the X-Men in our Titans vs. X-Men Team Duel episode, and learn more about Magneto in our Sinestro vs. Magneto episode. Magneto himself recruited his alleged children Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch, who had powers of sonic speediness and probability manipulation respectively. He also brought on other persecuted mutants receptive to his cause of mutant superiority, including Toad, who could leap vast distances with his powerful legs, and Mastermind, a psychic illusionist. From their headquarters on the orbital space station Asteroid M, they began their attempt at world domination by first invading a South American nation, usurping its army, and declaring the country as a new mutant homeland. Though they were driven away by the X-Men, the Brotherhood managed to capture the hero Archangel and held him prisoner on Asteroid M. There, the X-Men came to rescue their teammate, and a battle ensued that brought down the space station, defeating the Brotherhood. Despite being a formidable group, The members of the Brotherhood despised each other and were a dysfunctional and unstable unit. Though Magneto would go on to recruit other mutants such as Eunice the Untouchable and fight other superhero groups such as the Defenders, the Brotherhood team eventually dissolved. Years later, the shapeshifting mutant Mystique would form the next generation of the Brotherhood, enlisting a slightly more cohesive group consisting of the immovable Blob, Pyro, the Master of the Living Flame, Avalanche, who could control seismic vibrations, Destiny, Mystique's lifelong partner, and Rogue, their adoptive daughter. Together, they tried to assassinate U.S. Senator Robert Kelly, who had recently introduced the Mutant Registration Act, which would require all mutants to disclose their identities and powers to the American government. Their actions would inadvertently lead to a dystopian future called the Days of Future Past, wherein mutant hunting sentinel robots would control North America. Fortunately, Kitty Pride, who was a member of the X-Men known as Shadowcat, was able to travel back into the mind of her younger self and help stop Mystique's brotherhood and prevent Senator Kelly's death. 
Though the villainous group was imprisoned, Mystique was able to use her duplicitous connections within the Pentagon to grant its members a full pardon, provided they now worked as government-sponsored special agents. Rebranded as Freedom Force, the Brotherhood secretly recruited new and burgeoning mutants while still ironically clashing with the X-Men, since the state labeled those heroes as unregistered threats. After a disastrous mission in Iraq that left its members dead, missing, or captured, Freedom Force was eventually disbanded. Later, Toad, one of the original Brotherhood members, formed his own incarnation of the team with Blob, Pyro, and Sauron, and they allied themselves with a subterranean-dwelling band of mutants known as the Morlocks. Together, they fought against X-Force and clashed with non-mutant threats like Spider-Man, Darkhawk, and Sleepwalker. For a brief time, Toad and his Brotherhood allied themselves with Professor Xavier to stop a sentient version of Cerebro, and later the group was reorganized by Mystique, who brought her former lover Sabretooth onto the team. Unfortunately for some, part of this Brotherhood team was manipulated by the unwilling illusion-casting mutant named Mastermind into joining x Corps, which was a new team led by the Scottish X-Men member Banshee. He felt that the best approach to achieve Xavier's dream of peaceful coexistence with humans was to have a mutant police force regulating mutant activities. But when the former Brotherhood members discovered that they were being placated into serving on x Corps, Mystique intervened and rescued her former Brotherhood members. For a brief time, a Magneto imposter called Zorn reformed the Brotherhood using disillusioned students from Xavier's School for the Gifted, and together they tried to take over Manhattan. They were stopped, however, when Wolverine decapitated Zorn. Soon after, a former disciple of Magneto's named Exodus formed a new Brotherhood consisting of Sabretooth, Avalanche, Black Tom Cassidy, and Juggernaut, and they got Juggernaut placed on the X-Men team to serve as a double agent. However, it turned out that Juggernaut himself was a triple agent, secretly aligned against the Brotherhood and alongside the X-Men, who together defeated Exodus and his team. While various incarnations of the Brotherhood would subsequently pop up afterward, including those led by Mystique and Sabretooth, Wolverine's son Daken, and Magneto's clone Joseph, eventually Magneto himself remade Asteroid M and brought on old recruits and new, including Mero, the former Morlock, Unision, who is Eunice the Untouchable Zodder, and Elixir, the mutant healer. Of course, though, when mutants establish their own sovereign island nation of Krakoa, their own seeming mutant paradise, the need for the Brotherhood lessened, and Magneto diverted his energy toward maintaining the new mutant government. Now, each of our team duels involves seven characters going up against seven characters, because that is how the simulator has been set up. In regards to the seven Brotherhood of Mutants characters who will be fighting in this match, I knew I wanted to start with the guy who started it all, Magneto. He's taken the first slot as the leader because he is hella powerful and could probably take on all the rogues single-handedly. And that makes me smile. Or so you think! Regarding the original Brotherhood team members, I didn't want to go with either Quicksilver or Scarlet Witch because they later eschewed the team's villainous ways and joined the Avengers, and Mastermind I didn't think would be impressive stats-wise. But Toad, I think, can be pretty formidable. So he's my second original member in this match. Now, the shapeshifting mutant Mystique has led just as many, if not more, incarnations of the Brotherhood as Magneto, so I thought she would be a solid addition. And her second generation of the team is probably my favorite of the Brotherhood incarnations, so I brought on board Blob, Pyro, and Avalanche. For the seventh and final slot on this group, I went with Sabretooth who is a more recent member of the Brotherhood, but is definitely a quintessential X-Men bad guy who is, like, impossible to kill. So that's my Brotherhood of Mutants roster of seven. Magneto, Toad, Mystique, Blob, Pyro, Avalanche, and Sabretooth. I think it's a great team. You can learn more about each of those members in their respective dual episodes. I think they represent almost every Brotherhood incarnation, and I think they're gonna straight curb stomp the rogues right in their butts. Pretty sure that's not how curb stomping works, but uh, I do like your team for the Brotherhood of Mutants. I think it's a solid lineup of classic X-Men villains. Yeah, I really wanted to squeeze the Juggernaut into this lineup, but you and the executive producers wouldn't let me because all the DC guys are scared of the Juggernaut. And I guess it kind of made sense considering he's not really a mutant. His powers are magic based. So it was always weird every time he was on that team. Yeah, yeah it doesn't make sense. But uh, let me go over the backstory of the rogues, and I think you'll get a better idea of why they are a better team and are more likely to win. 
Now, during the Silver Age of Comics, the Flash, Barry Allen, who you can learn more about on our Flash vs. Quicksilver episode, accidentally discovered the multiverse when he vibrated his molecules at an alternative frequency to his own dimension and ended up on Earth 2, where he met the Flash, Jay Garrick, who you can learn more about on our Flash vs. Electro episode. After the two met, they began teaming up and helping each other in their respective adventures, putting their rogues gallery of villains at an even greater disadvantage. During a costumed charity ball, Barry decided to attend dressed as the Flash, though a couple of his villains decided to do the same, namely Captain Cold and Trickster, who were individually determined to steal the charitable donations at the ball. When Captain Cold and Trickster caught each other and realized they had the same plan, they began to argue, attracting the attention of Barry and Jay, who had recently arrived. Realizing neither of them could take on two Flashes individually, Captain Cold and Trickster began working together, like their opponents. This was the very first instance of Flash villains teaming up, and it worked. Together, Captain Cold and Trickster were able to trap the two Flashes and escape with the loot. Though the villains were later captured, their prior success would serve as a precedence that the Flash could indeed be defeated through teamwork. Not long after, Gorilla Grodd, who you can learn more about in our Gorilla Grodd vs. Psylocke episode, broke six of the Flash's villains out of prison in order to distract the Flash and drain his speed while Grodd worked on his plan to take over the world with a guerrilla army. Those villains, Captain Cold, Heatwave, Mirror Master, Captain Boomerang, Pied Piper, and The Top, you can learn all about in their respective dual episodes. They attacked the Flash and were nearly successful in killing him were it not for the fact that their trap led him to the second floor of a building, and when they all fired their weapons on the Flash simultaneously, they erroneously thought they disintegrated him, when in reality he phased through the ground to the first floor and ran away. When the group next encountered the Flash, he used their weapons against them, after which Grodd's plan was thwarted. Imprisoned once again, the villains nonetheless realized their strength in numbers and formed not so much a team, but an alliance or club, bound by a set of rules created by Captain Cold in order to maximize their success and profits. Rules to avoid killing and drug use in order to reduce attention to themselves. Unlike many supervillains, the Flash's rogues are blue collar. They're not out to destroy cities or rule the world, they're merely trying to earn a living, albeit through robbery and burglary. Over the years, different Flash villains rotated in and out of the rogues, either while some were imprisoned or some found it difficult to follow the rules. Other early members included Weather Wizard, Trickster, Abracadabra, Golden Glider, and the Rainbow Raider. Around this time, members of the Justice League began secretly erasing the memories or altering the personalities of several villains, including the top. After the death of Barry Allen during the Crisis on Infinite Earths event merged the DC Comics multiverse into one universe, the rogues, who largely respected the Flash, disbanded for a time. Eventually, five members, Captain Cold, Captain Boomerang, Heatwave, Mirror Master, and Weather Wizard, were convinced by Abracadabra to blow up five seemingly random sites simultaneously across the United States. Unbeknownst to the rogues, Abra had made a deal with the demon Neuron to free him from hell with the explosions which formed a pentagram. The rogues died in the explosions and went to hell, while other villains on Earth were offered deals with the devil to gain increased power, which many of them took. One of those villains, the Trickster, was able to deduce Neuron's weakness, however, which helped in his defeat. And the Flash, now Wally West, who you can learn more about in our Flash vs. Speedball episode, was able to get the rogues who had died out of hell. With many of them frightened by their time in hell, or unknowingly psychically manipulated by the top into reforming, the rogues disbanded once again. A new villain, Blacksmith, formed her own rogues team, one much more violent, consisting of Weather Wizard, Mirror Master, Magenta, Murmur, Girder, Plunder, and a new, younger version of Trickster. When Blacksmith's plan for her rogues to kill the Flash failed, the ever-loyal Captain Cold emerged and helped Weather Wizard, Trickster, and Mirror Master escape the Speedster. 
When Wally West discovered that Barry Allen and Zatanna had altered the personality of the top and tried to restore the villain's mind, the top revealed his own manipulations of other rogues just as a war broke out between two factions. Captain Cold's rogues, consisting of him, Mirror Master, Weather Wizard, the young trickster, and a new, younger Captain Boomerang, against the team of reformed rogues, which included the Trickster, Heatwave, Magenta, and Pied Piper, many of which actually worked for the FBI during the time. The war ended when the top undid his psychic manipulations on the reformed rogues and tried to kill them all with his own rogues team, consisting of Girder, Murmur, Plunder, Double Down, and Tar Pit, all psychically under the top's control. Captain Cold was able to defeat the top, however, and the rogues team became stronger than ever after the ordeal. The rogues were later approached by Inertia, a clone of Bart Allen, aka Impulse, who you can learn more about in our Impulse vs. Speed episode. Inertia made the rogues believe that he had created a machine capable of stopping time, when in reality, it would drain the newest Flash, Bart Allen, of his Speed Force power temporarily. When the machine worked successfully, the rogues, consisting of Captain Cold, Heatwave, Weather Wizard, Abracadabra, Mirror Master, Trickster, and Pied Piper, were forced to kill the Flash before his power returned. Realizing they were tricked into killing a young version of the Flash, they went on the run, hunted by the authorities and the superhero community at large. Caught and imprisoned on the Planet of Salvation, along with Earth's other supervillains, they eventually made their way back to Earth and got their revenge on Inertia, though not before he killed Weather Wizard's son. The team nearly disbanded afterward, until they learned that Barry Allen had returned from the dead. In post-Flashpoint continuity, the rogues began as a tight-knit group, who at the urging of Captain Cold, underwent an experimental procedure to merge their weaponry with their bodies. Golden Glider, Mirror Master, Weather Wizard, and Heatwave suffered unbearable side effects as a result and tried to kill Captain Cold in revenge, though he and the Flash were eventually able to reverse the process. Recently, Central City Mayor Gregory Wolf released the rogues from jail and deputized each member into the police department to help defend the city from the Lords of Order. Now for my roster of rogues, it wasn't too much of a challenge to come up with as the team membership has remained relatively consistent over the years. Captain Cold, as the team leader, was a no-brainer, as was Mirror Master, a member of the original team. Weather Wizard has been a powerful team mainstay since its early years, as has various incarnations of the Trickster. Though Pied Piper has been an ally of the Flash for much of his career, he was an original rogue and has been a part of the team for many of their defining moments, so I decided to include him. Though I could have gone with Captain Boomerang or Heatwave for my 6th and 7th team members in this match, since both are original and recurring members of the team, Captain Boomerang was already a member of my Suicide Squad roster, and Heatwave didn't have the power necessary to compete against a team as powerful as the Brotherhood of Mutants. Especially when, you know, they're going up against Pyro, and Pyro would just totally wallop Heatwave, you know? Probably, I'm not going to lie, since, you know, Pyro can control all of Heatwave's flames. Now, when Captain Boomerang is not on the team, Abracadabra often serves as a substitute, I found, and deciding I'd need some kind of speedster on my team, I'm going with the original rogue team member, the top, as my seventh member. So that's the team. Captain Cold, Mirror Master, Weather Wizard, Trickster, Pied Piper, Abracadabra, and the top. You're going down! Yeah, a great match of formidable villains with some of the lamest names in villain history. M more than the Blob? Better than Rainbow Raider? He's not on my roster! The For that very like, reason! Sounds like a leprechaun. For that very reason! <laughs> <laughs> but now that we've got these team's histories and rosters out of the way, let's speculate on how one of these simulated matches will go. The winning team is determined by simulations, not the speculation, but it's fun to imagine how the fight could play out. Alfred Jarvis 9000, what are the rules of the speculation? Well, I should say there are no rules, other than the teams have no prior knowledge of the other going into the fight. All they are aware of starting out is that the other side is a threat that needs to be eliminated. For the speculation, 
the groups will begin approximately 50 metres apart in a nondescript environment that will have no bearing on the match itself, as no environmental statistics are considered in my simulations. The teams must earn victory on their own merit. All right then, let's get into it. The rogues and their brotherhood of mutants meet on the battlefield. Who goes first? This is the first team duel in a while where there's like no super speedsters, right? Yeah. I guess Top is a super speedster. Right. But um, I think with the rogues as a whole, I think they're more in sync and I think they would actually wait and see what the other side would do and then respond accordingly. Whereas like the Brotherhood has some members that would just go for it. Like particularly, I think Sabretooth, who wouldn't give a shit about caution and just like sprint straight forward ahead like a rabid cheetah and kind of like scatter the rogues as they try to get out of his way of being pounced. I don't know if I agree with you entirely, but you're probably right that like the rogues are no dummies and I could see them like starting out with some defensive tactics in their playbook. And of course the best defense is a good offense. So Captain Cold's gonna fire his gun to sap Sabretooth's thermal motion and just freeze him in place. And then the top who is a speedster, he's gonna roll out a volley of explosive tops that wind their way over really fast to each of the Brotherhood and blow them up like grenades. All right, well, the Brotherhood knows that the best offense is a good defense, and these grenade tops never reach them because Avalanche sees them approaching and he's gonna send out seismic waves into the battlefield that's gonna break up the ground, causing these explosive tops to bounce off course and, and fall over. And Pyro, he's gonna get to work right away thawing Sabretooth out by putting him in like this firebox, like a hot oven that unfreezes Sabretooth. And then Toad is gonna leap over to Pied Piper and wrap up his flute arm with his prehensile tongue and it's gonna keep him from playing his flute. I mean, Pied Piper doesn't need his flute to make music and, and waves. So, you know, he's just gonna pull his arm back so that Toad's tongue is like super taut, like a guitar string. And then he's just gonna like, <laughs> pluck it and and like create a music note that's going to reverberate like at this frequency that's going to cause Toad to like immediately become sick and just like puke his guts out. <laughs> you don't want Toad to get sick, dude. Because like his uh, barf probably contains that sticky resin that he secretes and that would be like dangerous to the rogues. So yeah, yeah. Toad barfs all over Pied Piper who then becomes paralyzed and, like, delusional from the toxic pheromone that's in Toad's saliva. Okay, Pied Piper, he's out for the moment. But meanwhile, Trickster, he's gonna, you know, run on air over to the Blob, who's, you know, gonna probably try and swat him out of the air. But Trickster, he's just too agile and too quick, and he's gonna throw a stink bomb at the Blob, (laughs) which is gonna cause him to, like, suffocate and pass out from the horrible stench. Um... Blob could probably use his skin as like nose plugs because his skin is, you know, like kind of stretchy and malleable to kind of close up his nostrils. So he doesn't smell the stink bomb and the blob catches Trickster by surprise by snatching him out of the air in his giant fist and then just slamming that little twerp into the floor. Okay, but like before Blob can slam Trickster, Abracadabra is going to use the futuristic circuitry in his suit to teleport over to Blob and like wrap him up in a series of metal linking rings, like binding his neck and his arms and and his limbs. And the rings are going to shrink to like slowly squeeze the blob to death. Wait, what what kind of rings did you say these were? Like the, what magicians use, those metal. Sorry, uh, metal, what? (laughs) I was waiting for that word to pop up. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So like Magneto detects these metal linking rings that uh, Ebra is using and he's gonna rescue Blob by expanding the rings and then forming them into one long metal spear that he's just gonna send right through Abracadabra, impaling the guy. No, but I mean, like, Abra, he has really quick reaction time with his magic. So he's gonna see the spear coming at him and he's just gonna go intangible before it pierces him. Hmm. Meanwhile, Weather Wizard, he's gonna summon like a thick fog that's gonna cover the entire battlefield. So like no one can see and like all of the action just kind of stops because everyone's blinded. And when the fog lifts, everyone's just gonna see that there are like a bunch of mirror master duplicates around the perimeter of the field. And each one is gonna be holding a mirror positioned at a specific angle. And that's when the real Mirror Master is going to fire his laser gun. And that laser is going to ricochet between each of the mirrors in in a way that, like, blasts each member of the Brotherhood. Oh, damn. 
Okay. Combo. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so each Brotherhood member gets blasted, but, you know, Blob wouldn't be phased. Uh, Sabretooth has a healing factor, so that wouldn't really matter too much to him. Magneto can protect himself with a force field. But, yeah, the, the rest get blasted by this laser. Uh, except one of the Mirror Master duplicates suddenly drops their mirror and then turns and shoots the real Mirror Master with an energy blaster. Because it was secretly Mystique all along who was onto Mirror Master's plan. I'm sorry, how? Well, it was like a combo between Mirror Master and Weather Wizard. So I figured there was some kind of communication on the battlefield where Mirror Master's like, hey, drop some cloud cover. I'm going to surround them with my mirror copy. So Mystique spied on them and learned this because she was disguised as like, I, I don't know, Pied Piper or someone. And when the fog rolled in, Mystique changed her eyes into reptile eyes, which you can see in infrared. So uh, she like joined the mirror duplicates and she probably knew that some of her teammates were going to get shot, but she used the opportunity to get a shot off in Mirror Master's chest. Well, that is and, quite and the flashback there, bro. <laughs> and like, while well, everyone's kind of like processing what just went down, Sabretooth pounces on the top. No, because like the top, he's going to spin his body around and like the centrifugal force is just going to knock Sabretooth away. And uh, the top's going to keep spinning and he's going to like whirlwind himself over to Toad, who, you know, tries to leap away. But he can't because the top like warps his sense of direction and gives him vertigo. And that's when he's going to grab Toad's tongue and just spin him around really fast, using him like a wrecking ball to knock down other members of the Brotherhood. Wouldn't Toad just puke again if he has vertigo and he's spinning around? No, because like the centrifugal force of him being swung around by his tongue is just going to keep it in his stomach. (laughs) I guess you're right. Okay, well, Avalanche is going to do to top the same thing he did to his tops, his explosive ones. And Avalanche is going to send a giant seismic wave of Earth at the top that's going to, like, trip him up while he's spinning and force him to drop Toad. And uh, before Top can spin again, Toad double kicks the guy right in the nards with his powerful legs. (laughs) And that's going to induce his own form of vertigo in the top. (laughs) And uh, while that's going on, Pyro is going to be back on his feet and... He's going to create a giant bull made out of flame, uh, and it's going to run over Weather Wizard and just trample and burn him. I mean, first of all, like, Weather Wizard is probably in the air, so he's not getting trampled. And second, you know, once he sees this fiery apparition, he's going to create, like, a torrential rain that douses the bull and Pyro in water, preventing Pyro from generating, like, any fire for a time. And Trickster, he's going to take advantage of the moment and he's going to use like a giant novelty pair of scissors to cut the fuel lines to Pyro's flamethrowers, like robbing him of his fuel source. And with Pyro like unable to use his power and create any fire, Trickster, he's just going to ram the scissors into Pyro's chest, killing him. Holy shit. (laughs) Trickster's like that lethal. I mean, in this match he is. Okay, so... Pyro gets stabbed with novelty scissors, which is a stupid way to go, but I guess he's the first to drop in this match. But um, if Trickster cut the fuel lines to Pyro's flamethrower, he's going to be standing in a puddle of gasoline. And Mystique is going to notice this, and she's going to lob over one of uh, the skull grenades on her belt, and that's just going to ignite the fuel and burn Trickster alive to death, a victim of his own prank. So Trickster's out. Okay. And uh, and then Blob is going to pick up Sabretooth, kind of taking a lesson from their X-Men enemies. Blob is going to fastball special Sabretooth, throwing him right into Abracadabra. And Sabretooth is going to slash the shit out of the guy and tear up all the teleportation circuitry in his suit and cause Abracadabra to bleed out from all these slash wounds on his stomach and chest. Damn, okay. I mean, like, in a desperate response, though... Abra's gonna bombard Sabretooth with temporal energy that ages him decades, like centuries even, until he's a frail skeleton that just crumbles into dust. After which, you know, Abra's gonna conjure bandages that cover his wounds. And uh, as for the blob, like right after hurling Sabretooth, he's gonna slip and fall right on his face because Captain Cold freezes the ground all around him, removing all the friction and preventing the blob from getting back up. Oh, that's interesting. So Blob tries to get back to his feet, but can't. So he's kind of just like lying there, unable to do anything. Right, it's too slippery. 
but uh, Toad is going to use the blob as like a trampoline because like the blob is rubbery and, and he's going to jump off of him really high up into the air and uh, he's going to land with a hard smack right on top of Mirror Master, just crushing and flattening him to death. Kind of like how he did in the first X-Men movie. Okay, except that while Toad was high in the air, you know, where Weather Wizard is, like Weather Wizard is going to just zap him with like this giant bolt of lightning. <laughs> Do you know what happens to a Toad? When it's struck by lightning, don't say it. The same thing that happens to everything else. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. That means he croaks. Toad is dead. Whatever. All right. Meanwhile, Avalanche is going to help Blob out, who still can't get back to his feet. He's going to create a seismic blast that causes the ground beneath the ice that Blob is on. It's going to launch that piece of earth like a couple of stories into the air and Blob with it. So now Blob is falling from a couple stories high now, and as he's falling, he's going to increase his personal gravity so quickly by so much that he's going to land back onto the battlefield with the force of a meteor, right onto the top, smushing and, and basically disintegrating the guy. Okay. But as Blob is falling, uh, Mirror Master is going to blast him with his mirror gun, and that's going to transform him into glass. So when he lands... Yeah, he kills the top, but, you know, his formerly unbridgeable skin now shatters into a million pieces. So Blob is dead, too. Hmm. Meanwhile, Mystique approaches Avalanche, and she's like, I have this plan to defeat these guys. And Avalanche is like, okay. <laughs> but then out of nowhere, Mystique straight up stabs Avalanche in the neck, killing him. Wait, you can't say that. I control my guys. No, but as it turns out, she was under the hypnotic control of the Pied Piper. Oh, I forgot about that guy. Pied Piper. Who, you know, obviously recovered from his paralysis by this point from the toad. So Mystique kills Avalanche and she's like, oh shit, what did I just do? <laughs> and uh, she's going to go into camouflage stealth mode to make sure that she doesn't get noticed and mind controlled again. And since she's hidden, she's going to sneak up behind Abracadabra and snap his neck. So now he's out of the match. Gonna snap his neck? Yeah. I mean, she'd actually just pull his head right off. And, like, she's going to look at it, and it's a puppet head. And that's when, like, Abra's <laughs> real head is going to pop up from behind his cape. And with, like, a wave of his wand, he's going to turn Mystique into a fucking blueberry. <laughs> You can't sneak up on a guy with futuristic sensors rigged throughout his outfit for, like, psychic effect. Okay, so uh, how many guys do you have left? I have everyone except for Trickster and Top. And you have, you just have Magneto. Well, I, I guess it's a shame that Trickster and Top weren't still around so that this could be a fair fight. What? Because Magneto who spent like this entire match detecting all of the rogues weapons and tools and all the metal within their stuff. He's just going to straight up taunt the rogues. He's going to be like, what a bunch of pathetic human weaklings who ain't shit. Yeah. He's going to say that like right before getting blasted by lightning and lasers and sonic waves and cold, just fucking everything. And you know, he dies. Really? Oh no, like, what is Magneto going to do against an energy force field, bitch? <laughs> Blocks all of it. And then he magnetically grabs Pied Piper's flute and sends that thing right through Captain Cold's head. Well, oh no, time reversal. No more force field. <laughs> How's Abracadabra going to reverse time when his metal wand is up Weather Wizard's ass? Um, and speaking of Weather Wizard, you know that nifty metal staff he has? No. Yeah, that thing's turning into like a spinning saw blade that just slices Pied Piper in two. And Abracadabra and Mirror Master are like, oh shit, this is some horror movie shit, man. Let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and Magneto's like, run, punk asses. And all like the metal circuitry in Abracadabra's suit, it's going to get compressed into a ball, just crushing Abracadabra inside of it. And then to finish Mirror Master off, he's going to take the freeze gun from Captain Cold's dead body and he's going to telekinetically shoot it at Mirror Master, freezing him to death. Match over. Yeah, okay. So Mirror Master, he falls to the ground and shatters, right? Mm -hmm. Now Magneto thinks it's because he was frozen, but in reality, that was a glass clone. Oh my God. Tell me, what is Magneto's helmet made of? Metal. Shiny metal? No. 
not shiny. It's reflective, all right? So Mirror Master is hiding within the helmet via Mirror World. And just as Magneto thinks he's won, that's when Mirror Master reaches out for Magneto's helmet and fires mirror portals that just like surround Magneto and, and traps him within Mirror World, leaving Mirror Master the only one capable of returning to the battlefield, making him this match's champion. Fuck Mirror World. <laughs> Dude, but do you know what mirrors are made out of? Glass. Glass and metal. Because glass on its own is refractive, not reflective. You, you need that metal backing behind it. So if Magneto's in Mirror World, you just gave him access to all the metal he would ever need. So he's going to escape by warping Mirror World and creating a portal out of it. And with him, he pulls like a shit ton of metal and just shrapnels Mirror Master to death. Dude, Magneto can't open mirror portals just because he controls metal. Sure he can. He's the master of metal. He can do whatever the fuck he wants. <laughs> uh, either way, as long as metal is shiny, Mirror Master will find a way to win. You mean as long as mirrors are made of metal, Magneto will find a way to win? No. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and leave the match there. Let's run the stats on these characters and find out which scenario happens either... Mirror Master gets the best of Magneto in Mirror World, or Magneto gets the best of Mirror Master in Mirror World. Pretty sure I know which one of those is happening. Let's find out. AJ, punch it. Inputting data. Running calculations. Processing results. Simulations complete. All right, that was a pretty fun matchup, I thought. I thought it went pretty well. I mean, except for the ending. I thought that was a pretty good ending. Uh, I already knew that pretty much Magneto was going to make it to the end of this match because... He was definitely the best statistically out of both teams. And after running all the simulations, Magneto won 90% of all his matches against the Rogues. Now, you know, the rest of the Brotherhood didn't fare nearly as well. Magneto definitely carried the team. Yeah, he was absolutely by far the most powerful character. It wasn't even close. My most powerful character was Abracadabra. So I thought he was going to survive till the end. But uh, Mirror Master is very tricky. Yeah, Abracadabra won like about three-fourths of all of his matches against the Brotherhood. And actually, none of the rogues lost more than two-thirds of their matches, about. They all kind of bounced in between winning a third of their matches. Top and Mirror Master won about half, and Weather Wizard won about two-thirds of his matches. The only other Brotherhood of Mutants character to have a net positive win rate was Mystique and Avalanche, who both won just over half of their matches. It looks like Pyro was the biggest loser of all the simulations. He only had a win rate of about a quarter of his matches. Yeah, he was kind of my weak link, but it kind of makes sense considering he's a little bit of a one-trick pony. There's a lot of people on the rogues, including Weather Wizard, Captain Cold, you know, Abracadabra could probably do it. They could all pretty much find ways to stop these fire constructs. I was actually pretty surprised by that. I definitely thought Pyro would have won more of his matches. He's still pretty powerful. He's no slouch, but really none of these guys are slouches. And having said that, Jonathan, who do you think is winning this team duel? Well, I mean, Magneto is really powerful, but I think the rogues are more well-rounded as a team. And that showed in the stats. So I, I think the rogues are going to take it. Of course, Instagram disagrees with me because they always choose Marvel. Uh, uh, yeah, 78% so of our Instagram followers who voted in the poll chose the Brotherhood to win. And I like this, like we got to keep this Marvel streak going where everybody picks the Marvel side to just totally stomp the DC side. I mean, by this point, why do we even run a poll? <laughs> but let's go ahead and find out the results of this team match. AJ9000, the results, please. Here you are, sir. OK, the winner of the team duel between the Rogues and the Brotherhood of Mutants is the Brotherhood of Mutants. Those puny humans could not stand a chance against Homo Superior. Although, you know, actually it was pretty close. What were the results? They really, this is your reaction? Yes, I'm sad. What were the results? <laughs> <laughs> the Brotherhood won an average of 51.2% of their matches against the Rogues, who only won an average of 48.8% of the time. So actually really close. This is only a difference of about 24 net wins on average. Interesting. Okay, that's that's closer than I thought it was going to be. When you first announced the Brotherhood winning, I got super scared. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's not a terrible loss. 
Of course, we run way more than 1,000 matches for the team duels. Since we pit every character against every other character, it ends up being like 49,000 matches. Yeah, it takes a while. It's matrices of data that we're comparing as opposed to just sets of data. But um, those are the results. I had a feeling that the Brotherhood was going to win this one. A lot of the Brotherhood of Mutants characters have made awesome appearances in like the X-Men films and cartoons and stuff. Even the upcoming Flash movie, I think, doesn't have any of these rogue members in it. No, apparently they're going with like a character named Dark Flash or something like that. It's, it's a rival character like Zoom, Inertia or Rival. I would love to see a Flash movie with the rogues as the villains, though. That would, that would be perfect. Especially if it was set up like Spider-Man No Way Home, where you have like alternate versions of the Flash, like Jay Garrick and Wally West going up against this team group of villains like in that Spider-Man movie. Oh, man, that is like a brilliant idea for a Flash sequel. If we get a Flash sequel, which we won't, which is just salt on an open wound at this point. <laughs> it is. It is. I hate it. <laughs> But that does it for this duel. Let us know what you thought about the results by writing to us at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com or by visiting us on Instagram or Twitter. You can find links to all of our accounts by checking out our show notes or visiting our website, dynamicduel.com. And on our site, you could also find a link to our Patreon page where you can join our Dynamic 2O tier and chat with us and fellow listeners, our Fantastic 4 tier, which gets you bonus content each month, our X-Force tier that makes you an executive producer of this podcast, or our newest Dynamite Podcast Network tier, in which we'll help you start your own podcast. If you can't join Patreon, you can still support the show by signing up for our e-newsletter, also at dynamicduel.com. And if you can, be sure to rate our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, or on our website. Our next episode is going to be another duel episode featuring one of the X-Men's mutant villains in Silver Samurai. We're going to pit him up against DC's ninja assassin type character, Cheshire. So it's going to be like a ninja versus a samurai. And that episode is going to lead into our review of Big Hero 6, which is based on a Marvel comic that we're going to review with fellow podcaster Dustin Balcom. So look forward to that. But that does it for this episode. We want to give a big thanks to our executive producers, Ken Johnson, John Starosky, Zachary Hepburn, Dustin Belcom, Miggy Matagian, Brandon Estergaard, Nathaniel Wagner, Levi Yaton, Nick Abanto, Austin Wiselowski, AJ Dunkerley, Scott Camacho, Gil Camacho, and Adam Spees for helping make this podcast possible. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Up, up, and away. True believers. It's Morbin time. 